All right, thank you for having me. Traditionally, the church has taught that there are two books of Revelation, the book of Scripture and the book of nature. While they're not equivalent, uh, both are divinely inspired, both teach us about God, and both are vital to, the growing, to growing in Christ-likeness. The church understood that contemplation of nature revealed evidence of God's existence, spoke to his character, and reminded us of his ongoing work of provision and sustaining. Properly seen, the created world was more than just rational, conceptual evidence for God. It was an embodied denial of materialism. For those who truly observe the majesty of the heavens and the wonderful complexity of our own consciousness, it is hard to imagine anything other than a world created and sustained by a transcendent God. Now, over time, the book of nature lost its privileged place as a doctrine in much of American Protestantism and was instead taken up by the transcendentalists, the New Age movement, certain strands of environmentalism. Our reverence for nature and belief that it can tell us truths about existence did not entirely disappear, but it did shrink and move under the purview of secularism. But the importance of the book of nature was never the doctrine as such, but the practice of attending to God's creation and meditating upon it. So even when evangelicals in, say, the early 20th century were not taught explicitly about the book of nature from the pulpit, it would not have been uncommon for them to experience the revelatory power of the created world through their forms of living. For example, my great-grandparents were farmers in Iowa. Their livelihood was dependent on the weather in ways that are utterly foreign to my own experience. They must have felt an immediacy to the petition, give us this day our daily bread, that I can only experience through sustained contemplative effort. Because like most contemporary evangelicals, I experience the world as a kind of functional deist. Although I profess in divine creation and preservation, creation most often appears to me to operate without any divine agency at all. It feels thoroughly explicable through science. It rarely captures my sustained attention and it even less frequently earns space for contemplation in my crowded and distracted mind. This is the challenge. This is a challenge facing ministers in the 21st century. Creation is an essential form of divine revelation, but the modern world makes it profoundly difficult to experience this revelation. There are two main factors that are responsible for this. First, technology and lifestyles of distraction demand more and more of our attention and overwhelm our interiority so that we cannot see creation for what it is and meditate upon its significance. Second, our secular consumer capitalist society assumes that the natural world exists within the imminent frame, and therefore nature is a thing for us to conquer through consumption or scientific explanation or exploration or feats of daring or mediation. To discipline believers toward an awareness of their contingency and God's majesty, we must teach an attentiveness to creation and a protection of interiority from the encroachment of technology of distraction. We must have eyes to see and minds with space to reflect. The loss of an awareness of the world's createdness and contingency is not a minor or merely academic concern. Throughout scripture, nature is used to testify to God's existence and his divine attributes, to teach us spiritual truths, and it is used as evidence of God's power and provision. Nature alone is insufficient and an insufficient guide to God, but it is a guide, one that leaves us impoverished in its absence. Consider for a moment young David in Bethlehem, lying under the stars, keeping watch over his father's sheep. With no light pollution to dull the glory of the heavens above, David feels the crushing elation of the sublime, an overwhelming sense of the immensity of creation, its incomprehensibility. Even as his mind struggles to grasp what his eyes behold, his thoughts turn to his own physical and temporal insignificance, a tiny being living but a breath, staring into the vast grandeur of heavenly bodies beyond his imagining. 
Psalm 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? In the quiet of the night, his mind moves to the creator of all. And his sense of insignificance is not only undone, it is upset. He viscerally experiences the love of God. The objective reality of God's care for him is manifest in the beauty of creation itself. So let me ask this question. Do you believe our modern forms of living are conducive to such moments of epiphany inspired by God's creation? If you answer no, then we should be alarmed. Because as the psalm demonstrates, a part of the telos of creation is to testify to God's being to humanity. Psalm 104 is perhaps the most beautiful psalm of nature, yet the understanding of the natural world expressed by the psalmist is one that many modern people will find foreign. It might sound superstitious or mythological to our ears. The quaint amazement of primitive man held captive, not really by the wonder of the world, but by his own ignorance of its secret workings. But as I read these verses, selected verses from Psalm 104, consider how the psalmist experienced the natural world. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my God, you are great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment that water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled, at the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make the springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills, they give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell, they sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. God commands all the incomprehensible forces of nature, forces that remain incomprehensible today, despite our best efforts to contain, master, search out, and explain them. As the hurricanes are hitting the East Coast, this seems particularly relevant today. Both the power of nature and its irreducibly complex interworkings are beyond the scope of nature to master. What has changed for us, however, is that it is relatively easy for us to ignore the insufficiency of human mastery over nature, whereas that's all the psalmist can think about. Psalm 104 shows God actively producing food and water for birds and livestock. Their existence is contingent upon God's providence. For shepherds in the Middle East, you can imagine how present this reality would have been, just like it was for my great-grandparents. The relationship between natural forces and the life of animals was not theoretical. It was immediate and self-evident. Life and death and the renewal of the face of the ground are all dependent upon God's activity. He sustains his creation. As Paul writes in Colossians, in him all things hold together. It is not possible to rec rec reconcile this psalm with the deist view of God the watchmaker who wound up creation in, let's say, the Big Bang and walked away. For God remains at work even in the growth of plants, not just their design, note that. But the psalmist talks about 
the actual growth of plants being caused by God. God causes the plants to grow to provide humanity with the wine, oil, and bread that God will then work through in the sacraments and unction as means of grace. The psalmist concludes by thanking and praising God. This, I want you to note, is the natural progression of attending to and contemplating nature. It draws us upward to God. Now, in the New Testament, Paul makes explicit what Genesis, Job, Song of Songs, and the Psalms express more poetically. In Romans, he writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his in invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Paul doesn't use creation as an argument for God's existence. He does not say that the design of creation requires a designer or that God's fingerprints can be found in creation. We are not detectives on the hunt for the being who made us. Instead, creation itself reveals God exist, God's existence and attributes, which means that the right metaphor for understanding God and the natural world is a book of revelation. We aren't solving a mystery, we're reading one. And in it, God's character has been clearly perceived. When Paul and Barnabas enter Lystra in Acts 14, we see an example of Romans 1 sort of worked out. Paul says, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of a like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without a witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God's common grace, particularly in the goodness of creation, the satisfaction of our hearts with food and gladness, is God's witness. The rains from heaven and fruitful seasons are particular examples, I would argue, that Paul gives us of a larger reality, the miracle of being itself. We might expand it to include children, sex, the warmth of the sun, the delight of the human body, our capacity to feel and think and imagine. Now the fall has marred all creation, but the goodness of existence remains through God's common grace, and it is a witness. In light of the scriptural teaching on creation, St. Augustine declared and in one of his sermons that nature is a book of revelation. He says, some people, in order to discover God, read books, but there is a great book, the, the very appearance of created things. Look above you, look below you, note it, read it. God, whom you want to discover, never wrote that book with ink. Instead, he set, it before your eye, he set before your eyes the things that he had made. Can you ask for a louder voice than that? Why, heaven and earth shout to you, God made me. And for Augustine, honest, attentive meditation upon creation should always lead us to the Creator. So in the Confessions, he writes, And what is this, God? I asked the earth, and it answered, I am not he, and all things that are on the earth confess the same. So I asked the sea, and the deeps, and the creeping things with living souls, and they replied, We are not your God. I asked the heavens, the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and they said, No. They said, we are not the God for whom you are looking. And I asked to all those things which stand about the gates of my senses. I want you to remember that. The gates of my senses. He says, tell me about my God, you who are not he. Tell me something about him. And they cried out in a loud voice, he made us. Augustine says, my question was in my contemplation of them, the natural created things. And their answer was in their beauty. The act of contemplating nature, which involves attending cre uh, carefully to creation with our senses and meditating upon it with our minds, elicits a question. The being of creation, if we grant it the attention it warrants, demands an explanation. Who is God? And in the beauty of, created, of the created world, we discover an answer. 
God is the one who made this. But if a contemplative nature is so, so obviously draws us to God, how is it that so many deny God as creator? Augustine's answer to this, also in the Confessions, I think is very instructive about the importance of attentiveness. He says, if one man merely looks at them, speaking about created things, and another not only looks but asks his question, then they do not appear one thing to one man and a different to another. They look the same to both. But to one man they say nothing, and to the other they speak to everyone. Oh, it would be truer to say that they speak to everyone, but are only understood by those who compare the voice which comes to them from outside, from creation, with the truth that is within. So it's not enough for us to observe creation. Two people may come to a beautiful flower and both observe it. And Augustine argues they will not both receive that revelation necessarily. We must also contemplate it, pose questions, use the gift of interiority which God has given to persons. When we do that, we discover that creation speaks. In John Calvin's Institutes, he writes concerning God's works of creation, there can be no doubt that the Lord would have us constantly occupied with such holy meditation in order that while we contemplate the immense treasures of wisdom and the goodness exhibited in the creatures as in so many mirrors, we may not, we may not only run our eyes over them with a hasty and as it were uh, evanescent, evanescent glance, but dwell long upon them, seriously and faithfully turn them in our minds and every now and then bring them to recollection. Let the reader understand that he has a genuine apprehension of the character of God as creator of the world. First, if he attends to the general rule, never thoughtlessly or obliviously to overlook the glorious perfections which God, has dis God displays in his creatures. And secondly, if he makes an, a self-application of what he sees so as to fix it deeply in his heart. Where Augustine calls us to contemplate the created world, Alvin, uh, Alvin, Calvin, that's fine. Calvin admonishes us to never thoughtlessly or obliviously to overlook the glorious perfections which God has dis displays in his creatures. He seems to anticipate our tendency to make worship perfunctory. So, we are to dwell on creation and to fix deeply in our hearts whatever wisdom we discover there. Note, too, how strongly he frames this, his language. The Lord would have us constantly occupied with such holy meditation. If you want a genuine apprehension of the character of God as creator, then you have to study nature. This is strong language. And I can tell you, at least from my own experience growing up in the church, this is, was never presented to me as, as a strong, as an important obligation for Christians. The witness of scripture and church tradition is clear. Creation is a revelation of God's existence and his divine attributes. Believers are called to attend to creation, meditating upon it in way, uh, as a way to better understand God and his goodness. Non-believers are, believers are held responsible for their faithlessness because of natural revelation. And yet, for most Western non-believers, the natural world ceased to be a testament to God's presence somewhere along the time, oh, let's say Darwin came along. And for contemporary Christians, Creation functions primarily as an abstract doctrine or a topic for apologetics. Through his poem, God's Grandeur, the 19th century Jesuit priest and poet Gerard Manley Hopkins can help us understand how the church went from Calvin's general rule, which is never overlook, don't skip over nature, to our general contemporary inattention and commodification of nature. He says in his poem, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out 
like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Hopkins begins by acknowledging that creation is charged with the grandeur of God. But he quickly notes that despite this grandeur, men do not wreck his rod. We fail to reckon with the power and, and might of a creator God. Generations have trod over creation, blearing and smearing it with toil and commerce. The soil is bare, he tells us. Perhaps it's bare from pavements, which has denatured the ground, or perhaps from generations of careless exploitation of the land. And as a, as a result, our feet cannot feel creation. Our shoes keep us from the kind of sensory experience of nature that allowed Augustine to hear creation speak. Remember Augustine, you know, the, the, the gate of his senses. <clears throat> so the effects of trade and industrial society separated humanity from the awesome wonder of creation in the 19th century. How much more have we been desensitized to creation in the 21st century? Consider, for example, how computer technology has altered the way we experience or fail to experience creation. Let's begin with attentiveness. David, Paul, Augustine, and Calvin all taught the importance of attending to creation with our senses as the first step in knowing God and glorifying Him more fully. In the year of our Lord 2018, attention is, the one of the, is one of the most coveted human commodities. Our daily lives consist in large part of fending off constant demands by apps, devices, signs, voices, callers, products, salespeople, websites, and videos. And they're all asking that we pay attention to them. App and phone developers model their designs after slot machines, intentionally cultivating addiction in us. So like a broke gambler, we never want to leave or look away. It's not uncommon for modern, modern people to spend the vast majority of their day plugged into something. We wake up and grab our phone. We check Twitter while using the bathroom. We read the news while cooking, eating, and cleaning up after breakfast. We listen to a podcast on the way to work. We check Instagram while walking into work. We spend the day laboring, and for some of us, this entails hours of staring at a computer screen where we badly attempt to multitask, which leaves us cognitively exhausted at the end of the day. At work, we veg, binge watching Netflix. The last thing we see before falling, falling asleep is the fading glow of our smartphone. And, we are forced to cut, and when we are forced to cut ourselves off from the internet and media for a time, a gnawing anxiety that we are missing out besets us. Now, the description I just gave may not fit your life exactly. Perhaps you have mastered a temperate use of technology. If so, good for you. Uh, but you're the exception. You're the exception. I suspect that most of us experience the frenetic, always on, always broadcasting, always connected life I just described in one way or another. How can such lives make room for dwelling on creation as Calvin calls us to? How can creation compete with dopamine addiction, which we get every time we get a, a like or a retweet? High definition screens, high speed wireless internet, and endless content designed to titillate your senses. Similarly, our culture has a destructive effect on our own interiority. One of the defining attributes of human persons is our capacity to conceive of our own existence, our own being in the world, to reflect on it and all its strangeness and wonder. When we contemplate our existence, we are compelled to discover some justification for being. Cultural anthropologist 
Ernest Becker once wrote that there is no secure answer for the awesome mystery of the human face that scrutinizes itself in the mirror, which I would offer to you is a metaphor for interiority, looking inside. No answer at any rate that can come from the person himself, from his own center. One's own face may appear godlike in its miraculousness, but one lacks the godlike power to know what it means, the godlike strength to have been responsible for its emergence. If we cannot find an answer to the awesome mystery of our own existence from within ourselves, then QED, we've got to find it outside. And it's not only our own being that elicits this response. Becker, writing about the natural capacity of children to experience the wonder of creation, states, the world as it is, creation out of the void, things as they are, things as they are not, are too much for us to be able to stand. Or better, they would be too much for us to bear without crumbling in a faint, trembling like a leaf, standing in a trance in response to the movement, colors, and the order of the world, I say would be, because for most of us, Becker says, for most of us, by the time we leave childhood, we have repressed our vision of the primary miraculousness of creation. We have closed it off, changed it, and no longer perceive the world as it is to raw experience. The great boon of repression is that it makes it possible to live decisively in an overwhelmingly miraculous and incomprehensible world. A world so full of beauty and majesty and terror that if animals perceived it all, they would be paralyzed to act. For Becker, who was not a Christian, we can only survive by repressing the primary miraculousness of creation. How, how different that is from Calvin and Augustine, isn't it? Luckily for us, hey, good news, Becker, the contemporary world is perfectly suited for repression, the repression of miracles. We rarely give ourselves the silence and time, the space our mind needs in order to contemplate and acknowledge this miraculousness. There's always something else that must be done, something else to be anxious about, to read, to watch, to preoccupy ourselves with. Of course, uh, to some extent, humans have, uh, have always been excellent at avoiding themselves. We are experts at not being alone. This was true in, in, in ancient Athens, where Socrates admonished his fellow uh, citizens to consider the health of their souls instead of pursuing wealth and prestige. It was true in the 17th century France, where Blaise Pascal lamented over our use of diversions, he called them, to keep life's big questions at bay. So the problem is not that avoiding contemplation is a new phenomenon. It's not, uh, it's that no other civilization, no other civilization has been better aided in diversions by technology. And few other civilizations have made perpetual busyness not only morally acceptable, but a virtue, like Western civilization has. In some, technology of distraction prevents us from attending carefully to creation and from the meditation on creation that leads to knowledge and glorification of God. These barriers to experiencing nature are aided, I would argue, by the rise of secularism as defined by Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor and consumer capitalism which are intimately related in the way they flatten be, a belief, flatten belief into contested consumer preferences. And they both assume that we live under an eminent frame. So when Taylor argues that we live in a secular age, he does not mean that most people are atheists, which they are not, at least in the US, if you ask them, or that the world is entirely disenchanted. For Taylor, a secular age re refers to the shift from, let's say, the Middle Ages where disbelief was all but unimaginable. You were a Christian, you were a Muslim, or you were a Jew. To the contemporary West where disbelief is not only a live option that we can choose, but increasingly it is seen as the more plausible option. 
Our default way of interpreting the world is also through what he calls the eminent frame, an order to the universe that is strictly natural. While it's still possible to believe in a transcendent God who exists beyond this imminent frame, we tend to interpret that transcendence as an exception to the impersonal natural order. And we are aware that we don't have to believe in God. There are other options available to us where meaning and purpose remain entirely within the imminent frame. Consider a rainbow for a moment. I have repeatedly heard evangelicals complain that the LGTBQ community has appropriated a divinely ordained sign to advance their own cause. And yet, I would suggest to you that for the vast majority of evangelicals, rainbows are rarely, if ever, experienced as divinely ordained symbols. Like everyone else in our society, we conceive of rainbows like any other natural phenomenon. When we see one, uh, yeah, sure, we rush to tell someone around us, did you see this rainbow? We might take a picture of it on our phone, post it to Instagram, and perhaps we briefly contemplate our scientific understanding of what a rainbow is that we learned in grade school. But if we, refle if we reflect on it as a sign of God, from God, that thought, I would argue, is probably fleeting. And it's likely to be a meaning, a symbolic meaning, added on top of our conception of the rainbow as a natural phenomenon. In Taylor's terms, we experience rainbows from within the imminent frame, even though we may imagine them, even though we might have some idea that they have something to do with some God out there. Let me give you another example of how secularism and mediation heavily shape the way we view creation, even as, crea uh, as Christians. And from this, I'm adapting a, a short excerpt from, from my book. I don't think most of us have a sense of how much we trivialize our faith in our own evangelical churches. This fact was brought home to me recently when I observed a vacation Bible school program from one of the most popular supply suppliers of prepackaged VBS programs. The theme of the program was understanding God as creator. Sort of the topic of this talk. Delighting in his creation, knowing that we are made for a reason and giving thanks. Like most curriculums, this one came with a script, decorations, a set, songs, videos, and lesson plans. The whole, the whole deal. In the sanctuary, the stage was decorated with gears, cogs, and wheels of various sizes and colors. And over them all, a sign announced the name of the VBS program. It was highly branded. On the floor were cans and cables and odds and ends that represented an inventor's workshop. Cardboard or cardstock gears were hung through the halls of the church. So the theme of this program was that God is our creator and that he made us for a reason. But the dominant image used to convey this idea was a gear. Rather than the beautiful, awesome mysteries of God in Genesis, the imagery recalled the divine watchmaker of the early 19th century deism. At the start of the program, the leader, reading from a script, asked the kids to share their God sightings, observations, of something beautiful in God's creation. Now, helping children to get in the habit of seeing creation as creation is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. For, it, it, a great purpose for any VBS program. After the first child shared her God sighting, all the other children said in unison, as they had been taught to do and rehearsed, quote, wow, God. Their lack of enthusiasm was so complete that the first time I heard it, I thought they were being sarcastic. Oh, wow, God, you put a squirrel in Susan's yard. Way to go. The proper response to awe is gratitude. But sitting inside that sanctuary, surrounded by cartoonish cardstock gears, the kids' wows sounded phony. 
There was nothing there to move them viscerally. Next, they watched a short video narrated by a CGI owl <laughs> who talked who talked, the CGI owl, talked about real owls and how they survive in the wild. The video included some nice footage of actual owls, which is nice, and some interesting facts. It was a bit like a five-minute Animal Planet show with loosely related verse at the end. Although it was good to see God's creation, even if it were on a, was on a screen, there was really nothing wonderful about it. Between the cartoon owl narrator, the factoid-filled narration, and the quick cuts that prevented you from dwelling on the owls, remember what Calvin called us to do, do you have to dwell, you can't just look over them. There was really no sense of majesty or mystery, none. On the contrary, nature was contained, it was cartooned, it was scientifically described. Oh, and the kids, here's the best part, the kids could take home the cartoon animal, or uh, the cartoon owl, in a little tag that could be scanned by an iPhone or an iPad with the proper app, so that after VBS was over, they could learn more about God's creation indoors, staring at a screen. If my description of this VBS program feels a bit harsh, that's because we need to see how absurd this all is. Here we are trying to teach our children that they are fearfully and wonderfully made by a great creator, God, who made all things and sustains all things by his mighty word. So we spend hundreds of dollars to mediate that creation and suck every bit of wonder and mystery and beauty out of it we possibly can. That's the end of that excerpt. Now, aside from the imminent frame reinforced by images of gears, and I think that's exactly what was going on, this VPS distanced the children from creation by mediating it. You have a screen, you've got a cartoon owl, you've got an app, projecting it through the lens of technology and media so that it's difficult to see the thing itself, the creation that Calvin admonished us to dwell on. Here's another example. While drafting this talk a few nights ago, I stumbled across an Atlantic article about a sensational new app called iNaturalist. In fact, if you go to the, iTunes, the, the, the app store today, it's still probably one of the featured apps. Here's what it is. So this app allows you to take a photo of any plant or animal or insect you discover in the wild. You're on a hike, you see, What's that thing? Is it going to kill me? Take a picture. <laughs> Using machine learning and crowdsourcing, it will tell you what its species is. Released alongside iNaturalist, uh, oh, by the way, let me tell you, it keeps track of how many um, species, different species you have discovered, how many uh, observations you've made, and there's a, a, a national leaderboard so that, you know, anyway. So there's a sister app titled Seek, and it's, <laughs> it's a kind of real world Pokemon Go, if you're aware of what Pokemon Go is. It, it literally is a real world Pokemon Go. So it gives you a list of species in your area, okay? And you have to go and discover them and take a photograph. And for every species that you identify, you get a badge. So you get points for all of them that you gotta catch them all, of nature. <laughs> so that's fun. Where iNaturalist mediates your experience with nature through machine learning and scientific taxonomies, Seek mediates it through gamification, which is an ugly word, but it really does describe a, a, a tendency in our culture, gamification. Everything's a game. Gotta get badges or awards or points, otherwise it's not happening. But if these but if it weren't for these apps, all right, so uh, you're all saying, well, I don't know anybody using that stupid app, Dr. Noble, so what's the problem? Okay, well, all right, sure, you're not using those. But our hike in the woods would probably still be mediated through, let's say, our posts on Instagram or checking in on Facebook at the state park to announce to our friends that, you know, I'm entering nature. 
or, or maybe it's hiking culture. It doesn't have to be technology, but we have so many sub-subcultures. You could be deeply ingrained in hiking culture, right, with all its language and products and things. And every time you go into the wilderness, it's framed, it's mediated through that subculture or it's something else. There are a billion different ways that we cannot see what's right in front of us. So given this mediation, the, pre the pressure of the imminent frame and technology of distraction, I return to the question, how can we disciple Christians to be like young David under the Bethlehem stars meditating on God's creative acts? Let's return to Hopkins for an answer. For those of you who know the poem, you'll know that I left out the second stanza. So after he laments that our feet no longer feel creation because they are shod, Hopkins writes this. And for all this, all the trade and the trod and the toil, for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh morning, at the brown brink eastward springs. Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. The first place for us to begin is with the recognition that nature is never spent. Our contemporary problem does not reflect a deficiency in creation. And the triune God is still at work, still creating, still preserving, still sustaining. Our task then is to cultivate attentiveness to creation, to make space for contemplation, and, and intentionally resist the effects of secularism and mediation. Pastors have a critical role to play in the renewing of our attention to creation. While they are not called to preach from the book of nature as they are called to preach from the book of scriptures, the latter is filled with examples of the former. Faithful preaching of Genesis, Job, Song of Songs, the Psalms, and Paul's epistles ought to emphasize not merely the historicity of creation or the theological truth that creation leaves us without excuse, both of which, I would argue, are so easily filed away by congregants as abstract facts, but also our obligation to dwell on creation, as Calvin describes it, to observe it carefully, the model we're given of David so that we may be drawn to praise and glorify God. Here's another way. Through corporate prayer, ministers can convey our contingency upon God, thanking Him not only for the weather and our health, which we, I think many churches, that still happens, but also His daily provision for us, His sustaining work and holding all things together, gratitude for God in whom we have our being. The way we discuss marriage, sex, birth, our bodies, sickness, death, love, and grief within the church can reinforce or it can resist the eminent frame. For example, the spiritual significance of marriage as an embodied and objective symbol of Christ's relationship to the church defies secular notions that all meaning is imposed by humans upon the natural world, a world which is itself meaningless and indifferent to human meaning. And so to talk rightly about marriage is also to push back against the eminent frame. God baked symbols into creation itself. They are not things that we force onto creation. Our broader church practices also have implications. So for example, uh, do we decorate our churches with fake plastic plants, dim and lifeless mass-produced cheap imitations of God's creation, or do we have actual plants, even though they require more labor and knowledge to care for? What do our adult retreats and youth camps teach us about creation? If we send our youths off to camp every summer where they, are, where they learn to view nature as a playground for extreme sports and wild adventures, a space for certain kinds of events, we cannot be surprised when they grow up to be adults who fail to see wonder and majesty 
of creation. The way we structure church events in nature will affect the way we see nature. Now in his book, Rainbows for a Fallen World, the reformed aesthetician Calvin Seerveld calls us to what he calls aesthetic obedience, by which he means an enjoyment, enjoyment of the playfulness, elusiveness, and beauty of life. He gives the example of all the different ways we can ride a bike. So we can ride a stationary bike at home while we you know, watch Netflix. We can ride uh, as a hobby. We can be, you know, get into uh, biking as our thing. Let everybody know it. Uh, we might ride to save money or the environment. But he says there is another way to ride. There's also the possibility, he says, of going out on a bicycle into the country just for the fun of it. You experience, you experience heat generated by your moving legs. Feel the sun and air brushing against your skin and hair. Think relaxedly, cursorily about this and that and the next thing, springing up for attention. Trust your sense of direction so as not to get lost. But all the feeling, thinking, and trusting are integrated, really and are merged into your expectant reception of the inscape of things. That is basically an aesthetic act supported by health and strength. And if you are wheeling your way through the land, you are open to the wonderful V-shaped arc of Canada geese winging south across the sky, and you catch the thrill of shadows hopscotching fields and the gullies under the clouds scuttling like jackrabbits before the wind. Then your bicycle ride is governed by the proper joy, the joy proper to a developed aesthetic life. And we find a very similar thought in, in, in C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, where screw tape admonishes Wormwood to not let his subject enjoy the unmediated pleasure of a walk. Instead, Wormwood is to convince the patient that he needs to walk for the sake of exercise. Both Seerveld and Lewis give us ways of living that are open to the splendor of creation, although I suspect that many of us would feel uncomfortable following their advice, at first at least. Imagine a walk or a ride with no smartwatch to track your steps, no photos taken, no podcast to listen to. It's a frightening prospect for those of us who are conditioned to always be productive. Which is precisely why pastors and other church leaders need to use their authority to encourage congregants, to inspire them to get over their disordered habits of distraction and mental preoccupation. We need pastoral care for interiority. <clears throat> to teach people the importance of silence and reflection, how to be still and know that he is God. At the end of Psalm 104, which I read, the psalmist says, May my meditation be pleasing to him. May my meditation be pleasing to him. Okay, how can our meditations be pleasing to the Lord when we don't meditate on creation? When even the word meditation is viewed with suspicion, as is the case in many evangelical churches. I hesitate to encourage pastors to give such practical advice to their congregation as it may lead to a kind of lifestyle legalism. And yet, we have gone so far astray from how we were, we were created to live that I do believe that it is necessary. Christians need to hear that it is important to contemplate nature, as Augustine did, to dwell on creation, as Calvin did. We can't begin to recover the book of nature until we can attend to nature and meditate upon it. But when we do, we will discover, like Hopkins, that nature is never spent. To close, I would like to read a passage from Marilyn Robinson's Gilead. The voice is the narrator, John Ames, who is nearing the end of his life. And this is what he says. I have been thinking about existence lately. In fact, I have been so full of admiration for existence that I have hardly been able to enjoy it properly. As I was walking up to the church this morning, I passed that row of big oaks by the war memorial, if you remember them, and I thought of another morning, fall a year or two ago, when they were dropping their acorns thick as hail almost. There were all sorts of thrashing in the leaves, and there were acorns hitting the pavement so hard they'd fly past my head. 
All this in the dark, of course. I remember a slice of moon, no more than that. It was a very clear night or morning, very still. And then there was such energy in the things transpiring among those trees, like a storm, like travail. I stood there a little out of range, and I thought, it is all still new to me. I have lived my life on the prairie, and a line of oak trees can still astonish me. Thank you. And may we all be astonished by a line of oak trees, even in our old age. Do you want me to stand up? Yeah, just okay. stay, please. Thank you, okay. Dr. Noble, very much. I appreciate very much, you know, so often I think these days we um, focus on the age of the universe when we think about the doctrine of creation. Yeah. It, it was a delight to step back a little bit from that and to uh, be astonished uh, and, and ponder the signific significance of the, of the created yeah. universe. I would be interested to hear your thoughts. When you were uh, growing up in the church, mm. You, you didn't hear these kinds of things, or you yep. would get this more recent VBS scenario. Sadly, it's not a caricature. No. It's, it's actually real. Yes. But, but how significant is it for pastors' parents yes. to lay the groundwork? So, for example, Charles Taylor's stuff, the, yeah. the imminent frame, the, yeah. the uh, secularity, those mm -hmm. realities, sort of the... It's, it's sort of the air we breathe. You don't yeah. even realize it, but, it, but it's deadly. Yes. So how significant is it to address those issues in addition to the discipling factor? That is to say, how do we, I mean, how, how significant is it to, to talk about the ground of that, to sort yeah. of awaken the awareness of the air we're breathing? Yeah. But then how do you then counteract that proactively as parents and pastors. You talked about a few of those things, yes. uh, which was helpful, but what would you recommend? So, so a youth pastor who's yeah. here, and you're in that youth group yeah. 20 years ago, what would you do today? Yeah, so uh, for example, I talked about youth retreats. So when you, when you take kids out to youth retreats, it's, it's a wonderful idea. We take them out to nature, get them out of the city. Um, how are we structuring those, those days? First of all, are, is there free time um, and even if you do give the students free time, you have to be aware that they are not, their habits are not going to be to use right. free time right. to contemplate nature, okay? So free time is good, but you need to provide them some structure. So maybe, in, you know, encouraging them, I mean, it might have to require some very intentional practices of saying, all right, here's your assignment for right now. You need to go out by yourself for an hour and just be quiet and look at things. Um, I think it might require that sort of basic uh, attentiveness mm -hmm. um, in, in a very practical yeah. way. Um, Calvin Sierveld, uh, in, in another quote which, which got cut, talks about how um, the busyness of modern life forms us. And he says, even when we go on vacation, sometimes out to the lake, let's say, we're so focused on you know the motorboats or getting there in a hurry um, that you know, a parent could imagine themselves saying, well, you know, I'm doing a really good job of, of, of getting my kids out into the wilderness, but are they really there? Are they present in the wilderness? Or are they distracted by all the things they can do that are exciting and fun and high adrenaline? So, um, and, and that's not to say that you can't do those things, but what is the kid going to come away with primarily thinking about when they leave that experience? So I don't know if that helps. Yes. It, yeah. it, it, in essence, I think it requires an intentionality and a purposefulness yeah. uh, in order for that to happen, Yes. it seems to me. Absolutely. Yeah. I, but, but to some extent, though, you know, so I have a six-year-old son. Yeah. Uh, some of this is sort of natural to certain kids. So my kid loves bugs because mm. he's a six-year-old boy, and he loves bugs. And so yesterday we were uh, walking out of the house, and there was some beetle thing on our door frame. And he sees it and he says, Dad, it's missing two legs. I would have never noticed that, right? 
Um, so here's one thing we can do is just cultivate what a lot of children just sort of naturally have because the, the natural world is a pretty insane and beautiful and amazing place. Um, I think if we foster what's already there, we can go, we can go a long way. You know, one of the dangers, though, is that, you know, uh, you know we were, we've in, introduced screens to my kids, and so my six-year-old son does love nature, but if I allowed him, he would rather play a video game. Even though it's a learning video game, teaching him math, he would rather do that all day long than go outside. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, other, another question, please? Yes. Yeah, uh, come up to the microphone, please. And we've got microphones on either side, so if you yeah. please come. First, thank you. Um, this is just really, yeah, I really, really appreciate what you had thank to you. say. Um, I guess my question is kind of twofold. Yeah. Um, first, is there like a, a kind of hermeneutic of nature that you use so that your affections don't just stop at the like beauty of creation, but they ascend to like yeah. saying, Lord, you are, you're beautiful. Um, and secondly, um, what are what are some practices you've personally used to cultivate these yeah. aesthetic habits yeah. of being in the world and, okay. and then ascending and delighting in God and in the yeah. things of earth? So um, I talk about this a bit in my book, uh, uh, um, something I call the, the double movement, and somebody else has probably discussed this before and has a much better title for it, but it's just sort of what it came up with. Um, and that's the idea that we can become more aware of God and that we live in God's universe when we do not stop at something beautiful and good when we observe it. This is going to be our intention. Uh, Jean-Luc Marion, the Catholic philosopher, um, has a section in his book, God Without Being, called uh, Idol and Icon, that, that overlaps some, some here. He, he argues that an idol is something where we observe it and our, our, our gaze stops. We fix our gaze there. And that's it. We think of the idol as a uh, perfect description or a depiction of God. God is completely contained in this physical thing. But an icon, he says, is something that we see through. Uh, it's actually just sort of a window into the infinite of God. And there's a, a similar uh, thing that I would argue, and this is the idea I describe of, of a double movement. When we go out into nature, if we see something miraculous and we stop at its, uh, at its beauty, and it's, it's the same thing with observing people, by the way. So if you see somebody who's beautiful, and in some ways I think this is where lust can comes from, one, one source of lust, a disordered way of seeing. You see somebody beautiful and you stop at their beauty and you reflect back on yourself and your enjoyment of that beauty and you stop and that's it. When, however, you see something or someone beautiful and it's reflected back up to God and you recognize the source of that beauty, the source of that goodness, um, I think that's a way of avoiding lust or idolatry or covetousness. So uh, that's the first question. The second question, um, it's, it's a work in progress, I would say. Uh, you know, my own, my, my own habits. It's a work in progress. Because, um, you know, I was not being uh, merely rhetorical when, when I used the first person so much in this talk and the struggles that I, that, that I have in experience, right? Um, a lot of the criticism that I'm offering about our technological, distracted consumer society comes specifically from my own experiences with this because it is something that we... Uh, and this is just how we use technology in the modern world. It comes up and we don't ask whether it's a healthy thing for us. We might ask if it's too expensive or it's a, you know, is this wasteful or something, but we rarely ask until it's too late whether this is good for our souls, right? And so that's been my own experience with technology. And so it's been a slow process of saying, okay, um, how can I use the good of technology? Because I'm not anti-tech. But how can I also create spaces where I have time to meditate, I have time to think? How can I uh, learn to walk to work without listening to music, without checking my phone? It's that kind of introspection and the discernment that I think we all need to have. 
So that's not, I, I, I've been saying as I've been talking about this book that I am not a guru, mm -hmm. right? I'm not the, uh, uh, so often it, you know, with books and, and programs and things, somebody comes down from the hill and says, well, I have figured it out, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, I can tell you how to get in shape, or I can tell you how to cure your whatever, or whatever, and now just follow me, and I'm not, don't, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not a guru, but I'm trying. Not to be a guru, I'm just trying <laughs> to live right. <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Yeah, please. Hey, as uh, Sean said, thank you very much. Um, I uh, am one of those, and I'm sure there are plenty in this room, who are required to be at a computer for much of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know you're not advocating necessarily to drop our jobs and go somewhere else, <laughs> no. but um, do you have any uh, particular counteractive practices that you suggest? Well, I, I, I mean, so um, there are a couple of things. One is uh, we're encouraged to multitask. And from everything I've read, multitasking is a, is a myth. And what actually happens when you multitask, and often when we're at computers, and this is why I'm bringing it up, when we're at computers, we're usually multitasking. So when you multitask, your brain is actually doing this. It's, it's running over there to do something, and then it's rapidly running over there to do something else. Which is why, and I, I briefly mentioned this, if you sit at a computer and you're multitasking for an hour, two hours, three hours in a day, your brain will feel like mush. There's like this cloudiness. And you sit and you're thinking like, what have I, I've just been sitting. Why am I exhausted and I just feel kind of, I can't even think straight. I don't even know what I want to have for dinner. It's too hard for my brain. So um, I, I talked about sort of pastoral care for interiority. If our, our brains are physically exhausted from practices that we don't need to do because we know they're actually not good for our minds, um, that's one thing we can do. So if you're stuck at a computer all day, all right, be intentional about avoiding multitasking. So if you've got to listen to music, listen to classical music that's not going to be constantly drawing your attention to lyrics. You know, it, it, uh, most of us have to pay attention to email, but maybe you just set some parameters and say, while I'm working on this project, I'm not looking at the email. Shut off notifications. This is one of the best things you can do for your life. Just shut off all notifications. You can open the email app when you need to. Um, um, so sort of setting those boundaries, that will, I think, prepare you so that when you leave work, okay, because you're right that we can't just say, well, I'm not going to have this job anymore. I'm sitting at a desk. Um, you know, you know, uh, monks transcribed for hours sitting at desks inside. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing writing or reading for long periods of time. But... Um, if you're not mentally exhausted, then I think what you can do is when you leave, you can be more attentive to the created world. I do want to note, too, that I don't want to give the, the impression that when I say the created world, I mean, like, you've got to go out to where there's no physical buildings or something like this. Uh, and that's why I, talk, I try to talk about our own minds as being, I mean, they were created. Our own bodies are created. So going home to a spouse or children or being with friends and doing something with them and enjoying the created beauty of friendship, like that's a way of doing it too. But maybe you, maybe you do that by not having your phone out when you're talking to people, right? Um, so does that help? That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for this. I love this topic. Um, uh, you didn't, you've been hinting at this, but I just wanted to kind of say it explicitly. Do you think yeah. it's possible that there are multiple functions of being in nature? Because you've, you've yeah. explicitly sure. talked about the issue of contemplating nature and therefore um, being you know, aware of God. But yeah. do you think that um, some of the benefits of being in nature regarding um, you talk about the smartphones and everything, is mm -hmm. rather getting in a neutral space where we are not so controlled by the social circles that not so influenced or, you know, and even if we disconnect from that, we can still be influenced by our own anxieties in our mind. And yeah. I think most of us have, you know, experience yeah. where you spend enough time in nature and some of that starts to fade so you can just think, yeah. you know, and do you think yeah. some of the function of nature isn't specifically contemplating but just being neutral. <laughs> yeah, so there's a kind of refresh, 
uh, a refresh of your, of your mind that can happen if you, you pull away from our frantic lives, that absolutely is something. Uh, also, the, um, you know, the physical enjoyment of nature. I've talked about a, a lot about attentiveness, which sounds more like just seeing and contemplating, but, but also enjoying a, sw a swim is good, right? Um, cultivating, like gardening. Right, that's a very, I didn't talk about that at all, but yeah, that's a, that's a, a form of, of, of being in nature and being attentive to it that, that creates you know, benefits. Yeah, there, there are a lot, there are many, many different benefits that can come. And also, I think biblically speaking, using the resources of nature when it's done with proper stewardship is also a good thing to do. I mean, God created the world and we are called to cultivate it, which means using some of those resources. So I think that's, that's good too. Yeah, so there's like, there's a whole range of different things that could happen um, with nature that has value. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. Hey, thanks for your talk. Um, you were talking about how it takes us some time to figure out how to properly use technology. So there's, yeah. you know, it takes about 10 years to realize what Facebook has done to our kids and such and such. Yeah. It seems like the church to date has kind of incorporated every piece of technology that has come into Absolutely. our life. I'm wondering if there's an argument to be made, like, is there a line where we should just full out reject it and not try to how to use some of the stuff? So maybe a specific test case, kind of maybe the next wave of what's coming, virtual reality. Yeah. Is this the sort of thing yeah. that we should start using and then realize 10 years later, wait a second, this really jacked us up? Or do you think there's wow. a place that we should just not even start to use it and just fully reject it? That's really fascinating. So the history of technology, as I understand it, is uh, innovation happens and then um, it spreads. And society, after innovation, society does not know the harm that that technology is going to create, but they discover it over time and then Society comes up with a set of norms. Sometimes they're legal guidelines. Sometimes they're just a, a, a kind of pol, a, 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 you know etiquette. But we, using those norms, legal and personal, communal, we try to curb the harmful influences of a technology um, in order to make it, you know, uh, helpful. In, in the past, what's been a, What's, been a, what's protected humanity in many ways is that innovation took a very long time, historically speaking, and it spread very slowly. Well, you know, you mentioned Facebook. So, okay, it's 10 years later, parents have figured out, hey, Facebook's really bad for their kids. Okay, cool, your kids aren't on Facebook. So, uh, that's not a problem anymore, right. okay? <laughs> oh, oh they're, so they're on Twitter. Mm, now, maybe your college kids aren't, but your high schoolers are on Snapchat. Yeah. Oh, the uh, Kim Kardashian dissed Snapchat or whatever. Now Snapchat's not a thing. Well, what's the latest thing? I don't know, I have no clue. I, I've, I've thrown up my hands, I can't keep up anymore. So the point is, if you set up, uh, and this is also true for your personal habits, if you're like, oh, I, I have a problem with, with Twitter, so I need to make sure that you know, I have an app or I have some patterns to control my use of Twitter. Well, that's great for Twitter, but there's going to be another technology coming down the pipeline you don't even know about that you will be tempted to be addicted to and to use in ways that are unhealth unhealthy. So what you raise is an interesting question because in the past, humanity has, we've, I mean, it hurts when innovation comes and we don't know the dangers, but we adapt. And because innovation was so slow, we were okay. But now innovation is so rapid Maybe we have to rethink for the first time in human history the way we deal with innovation. Instead of just saying, well, we can use this and then slowly over time we'll figure out what's dangerous and it won't cause that much harm yet because it's not going to spread and it takes long to innovate. So maybe our default has to be, not that this is bad, not let's say we won't say virtual reality is deadly for us or, or harmful to our souls, but we'll just say, we're putting this on pause. Let's, let, let's, let's discover what the ramifications are. Let's debate it. Let's have experts consider it. And then maybe after a few years, we can bring it in. And maybe that just has to be our default. I find that really compelling and socially highly unlikely to happen. <laughs> Me too. Because uh, virtual reality is cool. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you have virtual reality churches yeah. right now yeah. where people meet 
with digital avatars in an online space. So, thanks. That should make you cry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Noble. Yeah. So we have uh, two boogeymen to watch out for, diversion <laughs> and mediation. Yeah. Um, my mind has struggles with both of those critiques, even though I fundamentally agree uh, with your assessment. Mm. So we'll go with the first one, diversion. Yeah. Can we actually get away from creation? Um, we attend, we dwell, but you said we've been distracted or Perhaps we've just been redirected. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just cats out there mm -hmm. uh, on the digital world. We've been recentered beyond the grind of modern life to the globe, mm -hmm. uh, to double rainbows. Mm -hmm. um, there are digital gifts that have re enchanted the world for many, for uh, the, the the blind mm -hmm. can now explore the world in unprecedented yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, and people who have low mobility can Absolutely. see nature. Uh, so in, even in our alternative worlds, our virtual worlds, they, yeah. we're, our own creativity is ever developing new and glorious, beautiful things that are also worthy of contemplation. So I'm a yeah. contemplative person by, by just nature or and nurture. Um, so when I see this uh, unvoiced, you know, people group on Facebook that's crying out for more voice, I want to be distracted or redirected to attend, to yeah. dwell. So um, maybe uh, may diver maybe diversion in our in our world is is not so bad of, of a deal. Um, and maybe we need to be talking just about uh, uh, less of the boogeymen of the digital world. Um, anyway, I, yeah, there's less, of, a little bit less of a question there, but I do yeah. have this struggle that we've uh, that we've that we marginalize the digital gifts. And is it really escaping creation to be a part of, you know, the the modern world? Yeah. So. Um, I love Twitter. I love Twitter. So I've learned, I mean, he talks about um, learning about the experience of marginalized groups, particularly in the church. So the last few years have been very enlightening and helpful for me spiritually. Learning about the experiences of people who, um, for various geographical and cultural reasons, I don't know what their lives are like. And they're willing to share and I am growing in empathy and love of, nature, uh, of neighbor by doing that. Technology, so I guess where I would uh, sort of fine tune what you're talking about. So technology is not the boogeyman. Technology is not inherently bad. Uh, technology allows us to do many great things. Uh, take the, you know, planet Earth, for example. You're talking about, you know, being able to see things, right? If you've, if you've seen the series Planet Earth, you can have a deep appreciation for the beauty and, com and, and diversity of the created world that, I, I don't know, I've been to like Southern California, the desert I was raised in, uh, Waco, Texas, uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma. On my honeymoon 14 years ago, I went to Mexico. I've not seen a whole lot of diversity of, <laughs> of this beautiful world. But when I watch Planet Earth, I, I can so absolutely, there are good, um, there are good uses. Now, it's, it's interesting because when you mention, for example, you go on Facebook, you discover a, a, a marginalized uh, group ex lamenting, and you're able to learn something that's giving you uh, something really true and good and beautiful and valuable. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't call, categorize that as, as distraction or diversion. Here's, here's how we, it could turn into it, okay? So let's say you, you see that group and you're like, this is great, and you learn about it and you're part of that group, and then another issue comes up tomorrow, and you're like, uh, okay, I gotta get, I have to pay attention to this, right? And then next week, a political leader tweets out something crazy, and you're like, oh man, I gotta comment on this. Now you're over here, and then, 
a fourth thing happens, and a fifth thing, and a sixth thing, and your net, that original community that you talked about, is, that, that, that experience with them was really something true and valuable and beautiful, <laughs> you're not actually dwelling with them, not you, but you know, hypothetically, right? Uh, because you're so distracted with everything is important. You must pay attention to everything. So, uh, social media, digital technology, wonderful gifts. We need to be discerning about, okay, are we getting the, the good fruit of those gifts? Or are we uh, unattentively indulging in them and allowing them to shape our desires and our loves? Because if we do that, that's where I think we get into trouble. And nature will do that better. Um, so, um, Again, I want to talk about nature as not just, um, not just you know the wilderness, but it, I mean it includes everything from our bodies to our uh, inner thought processes. So um, it's not necessarily it doesn't have to be nature versus technology. I, I I I don't think that that needs to be the case. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Good yes. Questions. This will be our last our okay. last question. It's got to be so, awesome. Um, so, to is. be no purely pressure. speculative, okay. when you're thinking like eschatologically, um, yeah. do you see any of this technology um, in in the last days, or what do you, or in the new creation? I mean, Gosh, what do you see? That's a great question. I have no idea. That's pretty bad speculation, huh? Uh, I'm open to the possibility. So I think, I mean, this is not my field, so I don't, <laughs> yeah, I'm very much speaking off the cuff. But uh, I do think that we will be bringing in good works, uh, creations, into New Jerusalem. And so I do think that some kind of cultivation will be going on. And so perhaps that does entail some kind of technology. I have no clue whether it's going to look like an iPad. Uh, um, yeah. I don't know. Do you, I mean, do you have any? <coughs> no, no. All right, good questions. All right, well, thank you. Let's uh, thank, thank you. you again. Wonderful.